Well, the picture behind me there from a, a very talented artist, Paul Curtis. Um, Paul lives and works in uh, Liverpool. I used to work with Paul. I'll put a link below to his website. Today, we're going to have a look at formation water. This uh, forms part of our How Oil Fields Work series. We have a growing list of videos in our How Oil Fields Work series, and we're going to grow it in the future. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. So why is formation water important? Well, when we're trying to evaluate how much hydrocarbon there is in a reservoir, we use what's called the Archie equation. Now, I'm not going to go into this equation uh, in any detail now. Just suffice to say that uh, the R here stands for the resistivity of the formation water. Now, uh, if you want any more information, I suggest you go to Graham's website. Now, Graham, good, very good friend of mine, and uh, he's got a website which teaches petrophysics for dummies, and it's a fantastic site. This is what we do in, in petrophysics. We calculate the hydrocarbon saturation and the formula here, quite interesting to understand. Uh, the hydrocarbon saturation is basically one or 100% minus the SW, the water saturation. And uh, also, as well as uh, calculating the amount of hydrocarbon, it's very, very important that we understand formation water for flow assurance issues like the formation of scale. And we'll see more about that in a second. This is scale, and it comes in a variety of forms. But you can see these pipes here, they can get clogged up very, very quickly if you have basically incompatibility or changes in the, uh, the pressure and temperature regime, which could cause um, precipitation of salts from the formation water within your production pipeline system. So very critical. Now the basics of formation water. So deep down in the Earth's crust, we have aquifers and we also have reservoirs. Now, if you think of a good reservoir as uh, something like a sponge, it's got lots of holes in it. Those holes uh, would be referred to as pore space or porosity. And how well interconnected they are is the permeability. In the subsurface, these, uh, these holes, these pores, are always filled with a fluid. The most abundant fluid in the Earth's crust is water, formation water, and its composition can vary, and we'll discuss that in a bit more detail. The second most abundant fluid in the subsurface is hydrocarbon, and in the oil and gas business, that's what we're after. We talked about sponges, but rocks are a little bit different, as you can see in the photograph there, a lot harder, particularly if you hit them on your head. Now, Schlumberger, uh, recently rebranded as SLB, they have a, a definition of uh, formation water, and it's the water that occurs naturally within the pores of rock. This isn't fluids that are introduced during the uh, the drilling process. These are these are the fluids that have been there for geological time. Now, formation evaluation is uh, really looking and measuring by tools uh, used in the borehole, measuring properties like the uh, the resistivity and the porosity to, to actually come up and identify what the composition of the pore fluids are. Are they hydrocarbons or are they formation water? So put this information in here, pause the video to have a look at it, but uh, just to understand the differences between uh, seawater and formation water, what is the composition of them? And uh, you can see here that the compositions change and vary from wherever the water source is. Now, a lot of people think that you can get aquifers for drinking water to, to quite significant depths, but in actual fact, very rarely do you get it more than a few hundred meters below the, the surface that you can actually drink it. And the reason is, is because with depth, the formation waters become very, very saline. Now, humans can drink water up to about a thousand ppm of salt. Um, cattle can go up to about 2000 ppm, but you can see seawater, 30,000 to 50,000. So if you are caught out at sea, it's not a good idea to, to drink too much seawater because it won't help. The compositions are, are given in the table there, and you can see lots of uh, cations and anions are present in typical formation waters and seawaters. So for North Sea formation waters, um, lots of variations. A great paper here by Warren and Smalley. They um, really go through and, and give a, an analysis and, and an overview of the heterogeneity that uh, you can get in formation waters in the North Sea. From their paper, uh, we can sort of find information about how formation water composition actually varies within a field, an oil field or a gas field. In this uh, example here, it shows the, the piper field and how the salinity increases with depth. 
Another example, the heather field, and it actually shows that formation water changes laterally within the uh, Middle Jurassic Brent group. And, and this can be because of uh, different uh, charging histories uh, for both formation water and indeed for the hydrocarbon charge. But it's not just within the field, even at a, a geological basin level, we see variations in formation water. There's a very good paper here referenced uh, if you want more information. But here in the North Sea, uh, we can see back in the Permian, uh, the upper Permian, uh, we get formation waters that are very, very saline. They can approach 280,000 ppm. Whereas if we go north where there isn't actually any Permian salt uh, deposited, then what we see is much lower resistivity values. The salinity is down at about 20 to uh, 50,000 ppm. Sodium chloride equivalent. So here's a map from the Warren and Smalley paper and it's uh, showing the concentration of barium across the North Sea and it's contoured up. Now barium does vary quite a lot and we're interested in it because we get some barium rich formation waters which when we inject seawater into the uh, formation to for pressure maintenance purposes then we uh, can get the formation of barium sulfate sulfate's very rich in seawater barium sulfate is is one of these compounds that precipitates out and it pre can precipitate out in the formation in the near well bore um, in the perforation tunnels in the tubing all the way in the pipelines right up to the platform and into the separators and to the production plant so uh, it is so uh, really something that we have to understand and actually engineer a solution for. Now in Trove, this map here uh, just shows the bubbles, shows where the uh, there is major concentrations and uh, we have quite a, an extensive database. It's very granular. And here you can actually look and see, well, is there differences with, uh, with reservoir depth, uh, temperature, or even formation, and how is that controlled? Now, worth pointing out that barium sulfide as a mineral is also known as barite, and we do use that in drilling. It's used to weigh up or make the drilling mud more dense. Now, it comes from mines and it's onshore, and that's kind of different. We know about that, and uh, it is a solid precipitate and basically is kind of used in a powdered form to make the uh, make the, the the drilling mud denser why does variation in formation water composition matter so here's an example of some electric logs that have been run in a in a well and uh, on the left hand column here you can see this is the shale with a high natural radioactivity associated with uh, elements like thorium and uh, uranium which are naturally occurring and they tend to be concentrated in these uh, clay rich of lithologies. Whereas when it comes to a sandstone, they tend to be uh, very low radioactivity. So the gamma ray count is, is quite low. So this is how we differentiate between a shale and a sandstone and going back into a shale. Now the resistivity log, this is basically measuring the resistivity. Now there's very little uh, resistivity uh, within the shale formation, but as we come into the sandstone, here you can see we have a very uh, high resistivity and eventually it drops down to a lower resistivity you now before going back into the shale. Now this high resistivity, it's uh, basically it's hydrocarbon, it's oil and gas, which are non-conductive. So uh, they are very highly resistive. And so you get this response Response. Whereas when we come into the uh, the formation water or the brine, that's got a lot of dissolved salts. And of course, dissolved salts in water make it uh, quite conductive. So it's got a very low resistivity. Another one of the tools we can use, the neutron porosity and the uh, bulk density, can actually differentiate between uh, a gas and an oil. And also, we've now got the information when we combine all these logs together to actually identify the formation water or brine. In some cases, when the formation water is very, very fresh, it's got very low salinity, it, it's, um, it is quite resistive. It actually doesn't look very different to the resistive oil or hydrocarbons above. So in this case, we need additional information. Now, we can run logs like the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which uh, is shown here but it is an expensive tool uh, to run, or we can actually take samples and uh, we can actually identify hydrocarbon legs from water bearing legs. Now these diagrams uh, illustrate a little bit more about scale. So what we have here is 
we may have something like seawater flowing in from the left here, and it's uh, interacting with the formation water that was originally in the rock. And if these are incompatible, um, it might be that we get precipitation. Now, calcium carbonate is very, very common. Um, so we might get calcium in seawater and a lot of carbonate, or vice versa, and uh, we get scale deposition. And, you know, this will actually reduce the permeability, will actually make it very, very difficult to produce hydrocarbon from the uh, reservoir. Also, um, we could get scale deposition at different parts of the well. Here you can see deposition of calcium carbonate on the inside of the tubing, and it can come in different places within the well, in the sort of the perforation zone or higher up the well. And as temperature and pressure conditions change, uh, we can find that uh, there's precipitation at different levels. So this has all got to be understood to actually get a well that's going to flow hydrocarbons for maybe a decade or two. Here are a couple of examples of scale. On the left, you can see it's a strontium sulfate scale that's uh, been formed fairly uniformly uh, throughout that pipeline. On the right, it's barium scale, um, probably barium sulfate here. Now scale, it's bad enough in pipes, but when the scale starts getting into chokes and valves, it can actually result in the loss of control. We can't open and close valves, which can become very high risk. It leads to expensive workovers, mechanical and chemical solutions are needed, and it can cause an awful lot of uh, non-productive time. In other words, the well won't flow until you've actually sorted it out. Now, scaling um, due to incompatible waters can, can be a real problem throughout the production life of a well or a field. Here we're looking at a table that shows some of the uh, some of the cations and anions that occur in the formation water in this example and seawater. Now there are two major concerns, one with calcium sulfate or calcium carbonate, the other one with barium sulfate. And, and in this diagram here, you can see the percentage of seawater that we're covering. Initially, there's no issue, but as more and more seawater comes in, we get the precipitation of, of uh, a lot of barium sulfate initially. And laterally, we get um, the formation of strontium sulfate. So it's only really at very, very high seawater concentrations, i.e. we've basically flushed all the formation water through the formation, through the reservoir, that we actually get back to a, a non-precipitation. This is a fairly extreme example. So where can I find formation water composition data? Well, we would recommend our Trove Formation Water database. It contains over a thousand wells across the North Sea. Now, what we've done is we've combined and cleaned a number of data sets and we've put them all in one place. We've collated all the information and, and made sure it's uh, of a high quality. We have built-in analytical tools. It's GIS compatible. You can search by well, by quadrant, by block, by formation age. You can uh, look at any of the properties. There are 52 columns in here, so you can uh, look at the salinity the specific mineral proportions and various uh, cations and anions within there. Lots of information. Now, formation water chemistry is very important to petrophysicists who are trying to evaluate in new wells how much uh, oil and gas the well has encountered. It's very useful to be able to look up formation water compositions from nearby wells. We've compiled this. There's just under a thousand entries. It covers just about all the wells and fields up and down the North Sea. Here's a, an example of the range of information that uh, we can just sort through and sift through within Trove. Now within the uh, dashboard in Trove, uh, we could select something like, say we only want to look at the Bray formation highlighted here. We'll then see all the location of where the occurrences are, the depth ranges where they are. We'll find out information about what's the resistivity, the pH, and uh, which wells we have data on. So click of a button and uh, we can actually apply these filters. Very, very useful. We also have lots and lots of plots and cross plots. Here's some examples uh, showing the uh, chloride concentration across the uh, North Sea. Chloride content versus the RW, the red water resistivity. Uh, you can see the trend in here and pick out individual fields and, uh, and wells from within the database. We've also uh, can plot uh, the chloride content versus the sodium concentration. So we'll see if there are salt wells, rock salt, common salt, or um, if there are indeed uh, other anions and uh, cations in there, so calciums and bariums and magnesiums, etc., etc. And we can plot just about anything against anything else.
we can put these uh, on a map and we can actually look at a particular formation. So in red, you're seeing barium concentrations, in yellow, sulfate, and here in blue, we're actually showing lithium and more on that in a minute. We were approached by uh, one company to uh, ask us about lithium, uh, obviously a metal that's in great demand and uh, increasing demand in the uh, transition era. And uh, this is the uh, information we were able to glean from the, the North Sea. And you can see generally uh, low levels of uh, lithium concentration in formation waters until we get to, to depth and, and then they, they pick up. But only about 6% of uh, the formation water data actually have information about uh, lithium. And why is that? Well, I don't think it's uh, generally an analyzed. Uh, we don't look to see if there's any lithium in formation waters or perhaps it's uh, simply not recorded, but we do see a, a trend with depth there. So in summary, understanding formation water is key for a basin-wide plumbing. Just understand uh, how does the basin work and it uh, tends to be that uh, formations, uh, formation water increases with depth. So understand the plumbing, evaluate discoveries. Uh, we want to understand how much hydrocarbon we've got. We need to understand what the water resistivity is so that we can see the contrast between water-bearing sandstones and hydrocarbon-bearing sandstones. And finally, we need to uh, avoid scale from mixing incompatible uh, injection water with formation water. Trove is the best first stop for petrophysicists lo looking at the North Sea. I hope you uh, enjoyed this video. Please uh, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell. We need your support, so please subscribe.